Now, we are extremely pleased to invite a current Macomb County Commissioner, former Michigan State Legislator, and the leader of the Michigan Taxpayers Alliance, a man who's always fighting for the taxpayers, for the, the good people of Macomb County, of Oakland County, and the entire state of Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Leandro Leff. Leon! Thank you. So, uh, I'm here, though, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the secret life of politicians, policy change in the real world. Now, I've got a little experience. I'm a longtime political hack. You know, I, I, uh, I first got interested in politics uh, when I was in high school in, in Macomb County, Michigan, and uh, Ronald Reagan was coming to speak at Macomb Community College in 1984 during his re-election, and I went to the college to hear him speak, and it was very inspiring to me. And I, I didn't know a lot about policy or philosophy or anything much back then, but he talked a lot about ideas that I hadn't expected a, a politician to talk about, things like government really not being the solution, and that people being better at finding solutions in their own lives. And a lot of things that sort of de-emphasized the role of government, even though he was the president. So that was kind of inspiring to me, and I decided I wanted to get involved in politics. I thought to change the world, you had to be in politics. And so I started managing campaigns and were helping with campaigns, and later got elected to the county commission, and then the state legislature, and then back to the county commission, and blah, 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 blah. But I learned a lot of things along the way about where I was wrong. And uh, I'm going to give you a presentation that I give a lot to uh, college students who are interested in public policy. And these are college students that also believe, like I did when I was in high school, that the way to change the world is you had to be run for office. And I've come to believe that's not really the case, that there is a role for running for office, uh, and there is, but there's actually better ways to change the world than being an elected official. So I'm going to go through it, uh, The Secret Life of Politicians, how I, my discovery of what really happens behind the scenes and how change really happens. So the first thing is the myth of the policy process that we learn about. So oftentimes when I show this to college students, I'm not sure they'll even know what that's from because we all watch Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, but it turns out they do because they watch it on the internet and so forth. But we learn a lot about the policy process for how we grew up and what it's supposed to be like. Oops. You know, we go to field trips to the Capitol building in Lansing or Washington, D.C., and we learn a few things as kids and growing up that I, I think are myths about the politicians. One is there's, the politicians really are around to solve problems because in the I'm just a bill video, you know, the people are worried because a bus keeps crossing railroad tracks, so they write a letter to their congressman who introduces a legislation to solve the problem and it stops the bus from crossing railroad tracks. So it solves problems. Uh, number two, politicians oops, seek successful policies. And we think this is true because we see politicians on TV and words about policies are coming out of their mouths. So we assume they must really be passionate about policy. And we understand that there are blocks of voters that are listening and evaluating what they say. So we believe that, well, politicians are really interested in finding really successful policy solutions because they'll win votes. And if they win votes, they'll win elections. Makes sense. So that's what we tend to believe. Keep doing this the wrong way. We also think that we need politicians to address market failures, things that can't be fixed by the private sector. For example, pollution going into the sky. What would, what's the incentive for a factory not to just keep polluting the sky? So we need politicians to create regulations to solve those market failures. Also, how would markets build roads or do some other things that we think they have to do? But the other thing we think about politicians is they do dumb things for some reason, like this bridge going to the side of a cliff. <laughs> so we think that politicians want to solve problems, and they should want to solve problems to win votes, and we need them to solve problems because of market failure issues, but then, you know, we keep getting, gosh darn it, you keep getting me going the wrong way on this thing. But we keep getting Flint water crisis, we keep getting the, the, Obamacare, you know, the rollout of that being a disaster. Uh, all these bad things seem to happen that when they try to fix problems, and so uh, we think that, you know, at that point we realize that maybe we just got bad politicians. <laughs> maybe we need politicians, they solve problems, and maybe we need politicians because of market failures, and uh, they want to solve problems, we just keep getting bad luck. And the politicians we get are just unfortunate. This is my, sort of my dad's theory. He's always complaining and you know, bitching about, they ought to do this, they ought to do that. 
And then when they do something, he's always complaining about, wow, oh, we just got a bunch of dumb ones. We need the right ones in there. You know, I'm a kind of cranky dad. So uh, to understand, though, uh, why these are myths, I think it's important that we learn a little bit about who becomes politicians. And I'm going to speak in generalities here because um, a lot of different kinds of people become politicians. But there are certain characteristics that are more common among people who get into politics than are among the general population. Of course, this is the case with, um, with every uh, career. So people who want to become uh, nurses uh, tend to be people who like helping people with health issues. People who want to become veterinarians tend to be people who like animals. People who want to become engineers tend to be people who like solving problems. Uh, and so there's certain commonalities about people who want to go into specific types of careers. But there's one thing that's unique to being an elected official, unique to politics, that, that sort of uh, attracts people who are interested in that feature. So there's one thing that's different about a politician than almost every other career out there. So anybody have an idea what it is? <laughs> well, uh, they get to make decisions and impose them on others. So a veterinarian can make a decision, say you ought to have your dog's leg amputated, but they can't make you amputate your dog's leg. Or an, uh, 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 an engineer might suggest, I think you should build the pitch of your house, you know, the roof of your house, at this, such a way. But you still get to decide whether you want to. Uh, in every other career, you, the, the person has to interact with others and convince them to do something. They have to volunteer or agree to do something. But in the political process, uh, you get to, with a smaller group of people, impose your decisions on others. So this attracts people who like that idea of imposing their decisions on others, disproportionately, uh, naturally. Uh, and it also, there's a, 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 an increasing body of research that shows something that's disturbing. And again, this is a broad generalization. Uh, but it, it, it turns out that um, the people, oops, wrong way again. <laughs> All right, here we go. The, the leading um, researcher in the United States, uh, based out of um, Harvard University, is Dr. Robert Hare, who has done more research on sociopaths than any other researcher in the history of the United States. I so, <laughs> well, sociopath is a word that we tend to think of as meaning serial killer or something like that, but it's actually a broader term than that. It's about 5% about of the U.S. population, or population probably around the world, is technically considered sociopathic because they lack empathy. They have an empathy deficit. They can't empathize as well as others. It may not even be their fault. It may be they don't know exactly what causes it. But it turns out, according to Dr. Hare's research, and research by several other universities subsequent, that sociopaths are drawn into specific careers more than others. One of them, the number one career they're drawn into, is stockbroker, and I don't know why. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> yeah. but, the, but the number two career that people who are, soci who are diagnosed with sociopathic tendencies that go into are politics, running for office. Uh, and this is, again, not just uh, Dr. Hare, but oh, this is the FBI's, uh, the FBI's checklist that they use and determining whether or not a suspect that they're profiling may be a sociopath. So these are some of the characteristics that are on the FBI's checklist for sociopaths. And uh, as I read through this list, I got more and more nervous. <laughs> like, yeah, maybe I went to politics. Or, you know, it's like a little scary. Uh, but sociopaths have these characteristics more than other people on average. And uh, there's other research done by, in, uh, by, in, by Dr. Martha Stout, and uh, also at Harvard, uh, on this very same subject, coming to the same conclusions. And so you end up, you know, <laughs> you end up with a, a more likelihood of somebody who's sociopathic and going into, it's, again, this is a broad generalization because I served with a lot of folks and I wouldn't consider most of them sociopaths. Uh, but there is it's just a, a, a statistical chance that they're more likely to be considered such than the average person. So, one thing that I learned about in, when I was in, in, in throughout my political career was something about uh, elected officials. This is my giant scientific observation <laughs> <laughs> through many years of in-depth and detailed research. But 
most politicians care more, mostly about re-election and would not, are not unlikely to cast a vote that would cost them their re-election. Uh, unlikely to. And the ones that are passionate about uh, policy or are, are willing to even cast votes that might get them unelected, they're all over the map. Some might be hardcore business folks and are very dedicated to that. Some might be hardcore socialists and very dedicated to that philosophy. Some might be business folks. Some might be religious folks. You know, all over the map. Uh, but most are not that way. And I, I think that it's important to point out here, though, that, um, that this is not something that is wrong with politicians. And what I mean by that is every single one of us in the broad society is broadly the same way. You make decisions on what's in the best interest of you and your family. You didn't buy the car you bought because it was the best car for society. You bought the car that you bought because it was the best car for you or your family. You didn't move into the home that you moved into because you thought, I'm going to move into this house because society will benefit from this house more than any other house. You moved because it was the house that worked best for you and your family. The career decisions you make are the career decisions that are in the best interest of you and your family. So when we elect people to public office, somehow we expect them to be bizarrely different. We expect them suddenly not to make decisions in the best interest of their family. That's what we do. We expect them to become angels and do something different and vote in everybody's interest, even though we don't. Either none of us do. So uh, when it turns out and, uh, when, people, when politicians are analyzed, their DNA is put under a microscope by scientists, it turns out they are genetically human beings. So, <laughs> so they end up doing what human beings do. They end up voting in their interests. And, and, and that's just what human beings do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the politics of butts. So the politics of butts was something I learned when I was first elected. Um, every um, every uh, month for a, a while, the, uh, the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, you guys may have heard of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, a free market think tank, would come up and do a presentation on an idea on how we could save money in the legislature. And oftentimes the ideas were, they're all over the map on all kinds of different issues. And oftentimes they're somewhat non-controversial. These didn't seem controversial to me. And one of the example I always use is they would come up and say, well, uh, we have state police troopers that patrol the highways and hand out speeding tickets, and it costs us X number of dollars per state trooper when you add their benefits and so forth in. Yet, if, what if we took that same money and gave the money to sheriff deputies to patrol the highways, because they cost about 70% of the cost of a state police deputy. And if we have a sheriff deputy do it, we just give them the money to the sheriff departments, have them patrol the highways, they can harass us with speeding tickets just as, as well as the state police can harass us. And we would save money. So oftentimes I would turn then to my colleagues and say, well, what do you think? That's a pretty good idea, I think. And very often, even from different parties, they say, yeah, it actually is a really good idea. And then I would say, well, do you think you really in the coast concert idea like this? Introduce a bill. Like, well, I'd like to, but actually there's two state police posts in my district, and I got their endorsement in the last election, and I really don't want to lose that endorsement, and so I don't want to take their job away from them, so I can't, I can't co-sponsor it. Like, oh, all right, well, would you be willing to at least vote for it? Well, no, I'll probably have to give a speech against it on the floor. But I hope it passes, because it's actually a really good idea. Uh, the but was always uh, more important than the policy idea. Whether it was on education, whether it was on health care, whatever it was, the but was always more important than the, uh, than the actual policy idea. Let me see if I can do this. Yeah, so this is a bad picture of the white, but that's a, a picture of the balcony, the house balcony. And on the house balcony above the legislature uh, is always the same folks. Uh, well, yep, they're, they're lobbyists. Uh, they represent all kinds of different groups, though. Public employee, lobbyists, business groups, uh, all kinds of different groups. And they do something that you can't do. They do two things that you probably, what, two things, one thing you can't do and another thing that you probably don't do. One thing is they keep track of every single vote I take. And they've got their, at the phone time, they would you know, have laptops uh, and keep track of everything. Shelly would keep track of all her votes, too. And they knew exactly what my favorite food was, whether it was a Michigan fan or a Michigan State fan, whether they preferred basketball or football, they knew all these details about me. And every single vote I cast, and we would cast, how many votes did we cast a year, Shelly? About 1,500, 12 to 1,500. Right, 12 to 1,500 votes. Yep, and you know, that includes amendments and things like that. The Senate does too. And they keep track of them, and 
You don't. In addition, they would send us checks worth thousands of dollars. And in all likelihood, you don't. So they were there every day, and you weren't. And so it became, they knew how I was voting, and you didn't. So this became, uh, this became, I'm not going to get deep into theory here, but, um, but there's a theory called public choice theory, which studies the incentives of people in the political process, not how politics should work. Most of what we learn about politics when we were young and in college and high school was this is how government should work. House does this, the Senate does that. There's a, uh, you know, we, they focus in a committee and it kicks it out. And that's all interesting and great, but public choice theory studies how the incentives of people in the process, both lobbyists, voters, politicians, staffers, everybody else, what are their incentives? Uh, and what, how do they, what rewards do they get for making certain decisions? And it turns out that uh, by looking at the incentives, you can do more to predict outcomes of political outcomes than anything else. So what are the incentives for politicians to stay in power? So here's this very handsome uh, former lawmaker. Well, for some, it might be money. Uh, legislature today pays less than when I was there. Uh, today it pays about $73,000 a year. Uh, for some people, that's a very good paying job, maybe the best job in their career. Uh, but actually more important to many lawmakers is the other two elements. First, uh, ego. And there's, a, there's, there's something that happens in the, in the capital bubble whether it's at the state capitol or at the Congress. And that is, when I was elected to the state house and I walked into Lansing, all of a sudden, I was a lot funnier and smarter than I ever was before. <laughs> Everybody laughed at my jokes. The jokes that bombed at Thanksgiving were hilariously funny to staffers and lobbyists and so forth. And everybody cared about this, my sister's dog who was in ill health. They wanted to know how my sister's dog was. And everybody thought my stupid ideas were actually brilliant. So they'd be like, oh, I don't know why your amendment didn't pass, Representative Drillet. It was a really great amendment. Uh, and you know, there's this perception, a stereotype, that politicians are liars. That's sort of a stereotype of politicians. But I think what people don't realize is when you're elected in state capital, or the, certainly more so at the federal capital, you're lied to every single day. Everybody tells you your idea is brilliant when it's dumb. Everybody tells you that you're incredibly funny when you're not. Everybody calls you honorable every day. There's an event every night that you're in session. Uh, either the Michigan Chemical Council dinner, or the Michigan Asparagus Growers Association, or the Farm Bureau, or the, uh, you know, the uh, Automotive Associated Engineers. There's always an event, and people are always, lawmakers are always winning awards. You're always becoming the lawmaker of the year for the Michigan Realtors, or the lawmaker of the year for the Michigan you know, uh, the Trucking Association. So every, you're, you're always being called honorable and awarded awards, called honorable, and lied to every day. And over time, those lies, it starts to get harder and harder to fight through them, especially as the years go by. And, and all of a sudden, you get used to them. All of a sudden, it's fun being honorable. It's fun being brilliant. It's fun being hilarious, and it hurts when it's not there anymore. You want to stay in office. Uh, others are the perks, and there are junkets, and I went to the Super Bowl, and I sat on the silence at Michigan-Notre Dame games, and there's lots of perks, and one of them's a little obscure, and I'm going to actually come back to this one a little later, so I'm going to give you an example. So there's a state law in Michigan that says that 50 cents of every insurance policy sold in the state of Michigan has to go into a special fund used only by law to educate lawmakers about insurance issues. So you can do quick math on this. How many, there's, about, there's almost 10 million people in Michigan. How many insurance policies do you think are sold in Michigan every year? If you count auto insurance, home insurance, health insurance, life insurance, add it all up, it's a lot. And then take 50 cents from that. Now this creates a pretty good sized pile of money to educate what's essentially 150 state lawmakers between the House and the Senate and a few uh, others here or there. And by law, they have to unload this money educating lawmakers. That's actually hard to do. It turns out that lawmakers are bad at learning about insurance policy in a classroom in Southfield. But they're really good at learning about insurance policy in San Diego on a boat. Um, and so there would be three trips a year uh, that funded out this insurance fund that had to be, ta they had to burn this money somehow by law. Uh, that would take lawmakers on these trips. 
and some of them would bring families, and it was a, uh, and they were a lavish, uh, you know, event. And, and so there's a lot of uh, fun opportunities if you're a lawmaker. So there's reasons you want to stay in office. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this because it's a little technical. I don't have so much time, but other reasons. So what are you, what can you do about all this? And um, well, you could study all 1,500 votes that Leon Drolet took to decide if you want to reelect Leon Drolet. But to really be an informed voter, you would have to also study the state senator, your state senator. But then to be an informed voter, you also have to see, follow the governor. But then to be an informed voter, you have to also follow your congressperson and your U.S. senators, both of them. But what about your county commission? You've got to follow them too. They cast hundreds of votes. What about your, what, your, your school board? They cast a lot of votes. You know, what about your uh, intermediate school district folks? What about, you know, to be, you're, you have to quit your job, ignore your family, ignore everything else in life, and do nothing but study all these votes to become an educated and informed voter in order to make the right decisions, right? So, the problem with that is, your vote wouldn't mean crap anyway. And what I mean by that is, you gave up everything in your life to study all this stuff. Wow. And it turns out you only get one vote. <laughs> and then, it, frankly, think about it. Go back in the last election cycle that we just had and remove your vote from every candidate that you voted for. Did it, would it have changed the outcome of any of those elections? No. no. None of your people you voted for won by one vote. So you would have busted your butt doing all this research on all these elected officials only to cast a vote that turns out didn't do anything. Uh, so it's a bit discouraging. Um, so what this all means, it means that people who want government solutions, people who think the government needs to step in to solve the pollution problem, or to solve the road problem, or to solve whatever problem, they think that the free market has flaws and failures that can't address these issues. And they're right. There are flaws in the markets. There are uh, market failures. But you, they're not fixed by government. Your choices are a market failure or a government failure. Because you're not going to get, you're going to get a, a, a group of sociopaths making self-interested decisions uh, and because they know you're not watching, influenced by the takers who are sending them checks. That's the solution to the market failure. Not these brilliant public policy minds sitting down and making the best interest of all the decisions. So, this is all kind of discouraging and bad news, right? <laughs> yes. And there are people, there are people who decide that they are going to fuck that system. They're going to do the right thing no matter what. They're going to get elected and they're always going to vote the right way and they're not going to take any money from lobbyists. And these people are typically called losers of elections. <laughs> because unless they're self-funded, that's really hard to do. Uh, you know, if you ignore the incentives in the political process and you, you, you ignore them completely, uh, oftentimes you're going to lose. There are, and I'm, I'm generalizing broadly. But, um, so does this mean that taxpayers are screwed? That we're always going to lose because we can't go up against those <laughs> takers with all that money and where you can't follow every vote and so forth. So are we toast? Well, the answer is we're not really toast. For some reason, we still have some of our income. For some reason, <laughs> we still have some of our rights. That's right. We still have some of these things, and it's and it's not by luck. Uh, there's limits to what the political, what, what government can do, and what politicians can do, and those limits are established or are, are described by many by what we come to know as the Overton Window. The Overton Window uh, is was developed by former Vice President of the Mackinac Center, described by him as uh, the window of political possibilities. What is politically possible? And a couple of, here's a quick example of it. Elected officials, the most important thing they need to know is not what their voters want. That might be important, but it's not as important as what their voters will tolerate. What voters will tolerate is the most important thing for them to know. Uh, and each politician will only choose among the options of tolerable policies within their district, within their own Overton window. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'll give a quick example of uh, what, of, uh, I'm going to wait for the example. So, so essentially, and by the way, few politicians are elected by themselves. Everybody's got a team. So that team might be, uh, you know, local church groups, uh, might be unions, 
It might be in a particular big industry or district, if Dow Chemical, if you're from Midland, or whatever it is. Everybody's got a team that got them there. And so what they need to know, what the politicians need to know is what their team wants. And they have to know what voters will tolerate. And then they pick policy options that fit both whatever possible. So, for example, well, these are just examples of people, types of teams that the elected officials have. Uh, and each politician is a different team in a different district. And so each politician has their own menu on, ish, on, on any particular issue. Because they have a specific district, they've got a specific group of, of people who supported them. But there's overlap among these things. And what happens in committees and in votes is it ends up being the overlap that usually gets up chosen. If they pick something that their team wants and the voters will tolerate. Not necessarily the thing that the voters want the most. But among the things they'll tolerate and that their team wants. And this is, uh, I don't know if this is easy to read, but this is the Overton window of political possibilities on education, just as an example. So on the top end of the scale, there's no government schools at all. At the bottom, there's compulsory indoctrination in government schools. Uh, and then there's gradient in between. And the overlap on the menu options of what voters will tolerate and what, um, what their individual politician team wants, you end up with charter schools being acceptable, public school choice, both state-mandated curricula. And that ends up settling, you know, uh, even though every politician's uh, Overton window might be different. That's the biggest overlap. But the Overton window doesn't <laughs> stay the same. It changes over time. And, um, and, you know, it's been changing, for example, on state ma mandated curriculum with the Common Core. We're seeing pushback on that. We're seeing the public bit less willing to tolerate it. So the Overton window does change over time. And it changes something increasingly rapidly, I believe. So, for example, uh, these things are not things that you, a lawmaker could ever introduce or support publicly anymore because they're outside the Overton window. They'd be voted out of office. And I, I served with a lawmaker who sat near me who did believe that alcohol, for example, should be illegal. Uh, he believed that should be, people should be put in prison if they drank alcohol. But he never introduced a bill to that effect because it was outside the Overton window. He'd get slaughtered on something like that. Um, so politicians know only to introduce things that are within the window, the Overton window. And the Overton window does change a lot. Recent wins for bigger government were health care, <laughs> net neutrality, bailouts. You know, uh, the, they've been pushing the Overton window uh, toward uh, bigger government in some, some areas. Uh, and in other areas, less government has been winning or, or ch other changes. If I could get this to move, maybe. Okay, oops. So, uh, marijuana laws are rapidly changing. Believe it or not, gun rights are actually less secure in the, uh, in the 70s and sometimes in the early 90s than they are today. We've made gains on gun rights. Uh, right to work laws are a big change. There's been big changes in gay issues under the law. Uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, for getting government out in some respects of people's lives that have happened over the last, uh, rapidly over the last few years. And the good news is the majority of current elected officials already agree with you on everything. The bad news is they also disagree with you on anything. Yeah. Majority of them don't care. <laughs> majority don't care. Hillary Clinton, you know, she's anti-gay uh, marriage, she's pro-gay marriage, whatever. You know, she'll be there uh, and, <laughs> you know, um, so, so the, but the, the way you influence politicians, the way you get policies you want, are not always to get new politicians, you can shift the Overton window and get the vote you want out of the politicians already there. They're happy to change their votes. I hope that they change their vote on that, the ones that uh, let us down on the income tax cut, for example. You know, yeah. we hopefully we'll push that window. So a mission of not just limited government movements, but all movements, even the left, is to move the Overton window. Uh, most groups don't care which politicians are in office. Anyone will do. They'll vote however they need to, to be in their interest. They want to change what's in the interests of politicians. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? Well, pyramid of social change. This is developed by Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, and I've flushed it out a little bit. But ideas for change, policy change, start usually with intellectuals. And I don't know if I can do this. Yeah, so people like Friedrich Hayek, Marx, Freud, Einstein, Locke, religious leaders, uh, leaders who, who 
or conceptual leaders and, and ask themselves, how should human beings relate to each other and relate to their universe? They ask themselves the big questions. And they come out with ideas. And then think tanks like uh, the Mackinac Center or Cato Institute, Heritage, or left-leaning ones like Brookings or others, they oftentimes then take these concepts and decide how would that look in real life? What kind of policies should we support? How would we change laws uh, to support these things, to make them into reality? And they really, their audience is everyday people, but also communicators. The communicators take these think tank policy ideas and the broader ideas and communicate them to everybody else, but one of their key audiences is the actuators, which I think are people like you guys, uh, who then take these ideas out and organize and recruit voters and talk about them at clubs and write letters to the editor and that sort of thing. And then at the very below that are the voters that this group is trying to influence. Uh, you know, everyday uh, Republicans and that sort of thing. You guys are sort of leaders within uh, the actuators. And then after an idea starts at the intellectuals and it goes all the way to the bottom, an Overton window forms. And it forms once that idea has been gone through that process and it becomes something that's politically possible for the first time with the idea that starts at the top. Usually, it's just, uh, not always, but usually it goes through this process it finally becomes part of the Overton window. And therefore, at the very bottom is the politicians who wait for the idea to hit the bottom. So they sit around waiting to see what society will tolerate and what, how the Overton window is shaped. So if you want to make a difference, and I'll give a quick sample of voters' toleration. Back in the early 90s, um, how am I doing on time? Am I just blowing the heck out of it? Yeah, um, the 10 minutes or so. Okay, I'll go five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> so quick example of what voters will tolerate. So in the 90s, there was a lot of folks trying to liberalize concealed carry permits. It used to be very hard to get a, a concealed weapons permit. Uh, and there was organized Second Amendment groups that were trying to get that change, and they would introduce, they would, were powerful enough to get, um, to get a bill introduced to the legislature every time, but they always got crushed when it came up for a vote. They would lose by two-thirds of the, of the vote. Uh, well, the Second Amendment groups, you know, were obviously cheesed off. They wanted to win, so eventually they decided on a new strategy. They decided instead of lobbying, instead of trying to do all these other things, they're going to try and take out one politician in an election. So they targeted a guy, a Republican, from down uh, from uh, Wayne County area named Jim Ryan. Uh, and they, they, they relabeled him Lion Jim Ryan. And they, they sent all these Second Amendment folks from all around the state down to door knock for his Democrat, pro-gun Democrat named Bob Brown. And uh, they door knocked and they sent money and they dealt stuff. And sure enough, Jim Ryan lost the election to Bob Brown. Well, that had an impact. It showed what the voters would tolerate, what was dangerous, what was in the interest or not in the interest of elected officials. So six months later, there's another vote on a concealed weapons bill, and it passes the liberal. It, it, it's completely switched. Two thirds of the politicians voted for it instead of against it, and it was the same people. So, um, moving the window is the most important thing anybody can do, and what you guys can do to impact public policy is to be an expert at some point in that pyramid. Either be a great communicator or an intellectual that helps people learn about these ideas or an actuator like what you guys do to try and uh, round up folks and, and mold public opinion and, and shape opinion. Being an expert in that pyramid in one or more places in that pyramid and you will change public policy more than any politician by him or herself can. You will move the window and the politicians will chase it. They'll be chasing you. So thank you very, very much.